Hello and welcome to this panel session on eradicating poverty through shared humanity at the Horasis Global Meeting 2021. My name is Nicholas Johnson. I'm the CEO of Economists Without Borders and an academic here at the QUT Business School in Brisbane, Australia. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the world had entered an era with fewer low-income countries and far fewer people living in extreme poverty. Unfortunately, a byproduct of the pandemic has been a reversal of some of these gains by many years, in some estimates four or five or even more. What can we do to get back on track in terms of achieving poverty reduction? I'm excited for the discussion in front of us. Eliminating poverty is one of the noblest goals for humanity to pursue, and I'm joined by a remarkable array of speakers to unpack this topic. I'd like to introduce um, Rosa Leo, the former president of Ecuador, Robert, the founder and chief executive officer of Live Person, calling in from the United States, and Bruce, uh, the chief executive officer of Mindhive, um, also from here in Brisbane, Australia. So welcome to you all, and thank you to our audience for calling in. Um, how can we end poverty by, by 2030? The, this is the target set by the United Nations Agenda for Sustainable, de sustainable Development, and um, the first sustainable development goal was the objective of achieving no poverty. So can I open the floor to some opening thoughts from you? Uh, Bruce, would like to kick us off. Uh, thanks, Nicholas, and... and uh, and also acknowledging Frank and his um, role with Horasis, bringing us together in discussions like this, so, and to my other panellists. Um, I guess throwing it out there very early, I'm interested in the intersection between problem solving and technology and action. And so my life has been spent much in various problem solving methodologies, but I think we're at a very exciting stage at the moment where we've seen even with COVID and other uh, most recently the last 24 hours around dementia, where there's rapid um, seeking of insights into solving problems based on a crisis or based on a um, based on a, a, on a level of urgency. Um, this is an area where we could put more collective intelligence together. Um, we can use our technologies. Uh, there's multiple ways we we are connected now across the world. And so I'm interested in the discussion today about how we can how we can bring technology to solve the unsolvable problems, including today discussing poverty. Fantastic, thanks, Bruce and Rosalia. You've had got a very rich, um, you know, career in, in, in politics and in in, in the, the civic sector as well. What are your thoughts on the topic? Well, uh, first, thank you to Oasis and uh, Niklas. Thank you also uh, for the invitation to be here. Um, and hi to the other panelists. Um, yeah, I think the, the COVID-19 show us uh, uh, some things and uh, we have a lot of learnings, especially I think in, in countries like my country, Ecuador, or the other Latin American countries, we learned that we have to improve the quality of health and um, education, public health and public education. Because when you see what's happening with the hospitals crowded and uh, no medicines and not possibilities to get the vaccines, and in the other hand, the exclusion, the exclusion of uh, many uh, kids and many uh, teenagers and young people because they don't have a tool, they don't, they don't, have, they don't have a device to get connected to the school, or uh, they don't have good quality of connection. In, in my country, probably one from four uh, families get a good quality of internet in their homes. Then it's uh, really a disaster on education. I think the next pandemic is the, go, to going to be the, the lack of education. And when we think about the main issue about uh, this, uh, this panel, it's fight poverty and, and get the goals, uh, the SDG goals to uh, 2030. We are going to be a lot behind it and um, uh, if we think about uh, how to eradicate poverty it has to be through education uh, it, it's another way and to have good education you, you need uh, good teachers the the thing that i'm working more and i'm worried more during this time this last 20 years is how to improve quality of teachers because if they don't know what they are teaching or they, they are supposed to teach and they don't have the good preparation, not only peda pedagogical, but also if they are t t teaching mathematics and they don't know mathematics or they are teaching physics and they don't know physics, 
how we are going to get good students and good professionals and good people in science, in, in the hard so, uh, science or the social science. Uh, it is really, really a, a, a big issue and a big challenge. Then I put all the effort on health and education uh, to do better and to try to eradicate poverty, not probably to 2030, but um, we have to start in some point. Mm. Well, mm. Very, very interesting insights. Just, you know, we need better education, better teachers, better internet access. Um, Robert, over to you. Do you have any initial thoughts on the topic of how we can solve world poverty? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, obviously I run a technology company, and uh, so technology, you know, uh, you know, technology should create better community, although I think that's very much up to debate. I think a lot of the big platforms that are out there today that we had the hope of creating more connection and community and support have failed us. So I think technology, just as a word, has a mixed reaction today in 2021. I mean but I'll, I'll still use that as a base of my perspective on this stuff. I, I was fortunate enough to do a project with uh, Pope Francis like six years ago, six or seven years ago, right after he became Pope around this idea of tenderness. And he, and he talked about defining what tenderness is in this tenderness revolution, the concept of like, it's, it's really, when you think about a mother holding a child, this connection that two people have. If somebody is on the street and they're begging, look them in the eyes and respect them as a human. And, and that in itself has a power for both people. So when I think of like what I believe a, a technology platform should do, it should create this community around tenderness, but on the same kind of, it's not a polar opposite, is create what we call self-sovereign individuals in that I think the idea of being reliant on centralized education, centralized health, all of this, is, it's not working. And it gets more and more expensive. That's why it's more and more expensive and less and less people can get access to it. But if you look at things like even to take it to the blockchain and what's going on with crypto, but more let's talk about blockchain, there are a group of individuals called self-sovereign individuals that are out in the world and they didn't go to college impacted by the financial crisis in 2008. They were teenagers. They realized that centralization is not working, so they're going to educate themselves online because the, the resources are there. They're going to find their way to wealth um, by being a part of a community that's building things. And so I don't have all the answers, but there's something between self-sovereignty and community, which I think can help get people to be you know, to be lifted out of this world. But I just don't believe in centralized organizations are the answer, like more taxes to larger government or more NGOs. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's, if that's, that's working. But. Mm, yeah. I, I, you know, I guess in a lot of the consulting work I've done in, um, in, um, in Southeast Asia and, um, and some other places I've sort of seen, you know, poverty is the byproduct of a whole bunch of very complex systems, and um, uh, it, it can be very difficult to unpack exactly what is the root cause. Uh, but I wonder what is the role of government and what is the role of the private sector in working together to try and lift people out of out of poverty? Just throw it up into the floor. It was for me. Oh, anyone no. who'd like to answer. Oh yeah, well, well, I, I can say some things uh, because uh, when I see what's happening in in my country and other countries uh, around Latin America, and probably some in Asia, in Africa, um, I I know the the because uh, uh, we are thinking about uh, like global solutions, like national solutions, but I put a lot of emphasis in local authorities. Like when we are fighting, uh, for example, climate change, we get the agreements between the countries, the agreement of Paris, the Tokyo Agreement and others, but you, de you didn't get so much. Then you have to go to the level of local authorities because they have a lot of power in their communities. They know better what's happening on the territory 
And, and for example, when it's about education, that is my field of, field of expertise, I, I can tell you that, for example, connectivity could be a, a, a good um, situation if local authorities can negotiate with the, with the suppliers who have uh, good connectivity in the way that no one uh, uh, school, no one home is out of connectivity. No, um, n n n not a child, not a, a, a young uh, person uh, can be out of connectivity because now it's in the basket of, of the priority needs. If you are thinking about education, such a big issue, and you cannot connect and you cannot be in touch with the teachers, uh, you are going to create a new, new uh, illiterate people because they are not in contact and they cannot uh, realize how to work on it. Then local authorities are a big issue. The other, um, the other path that I want to, to talk about is how a private sector can collaborate. We know that now that uh, after uh, COVID-19, uh, most of the people are working from home. And even the big corporations, the big banks, the big office are reducing the space. They don't have the, the need to have all the people in a building, such a big building. It's happening here in Quito and it's happening everywhere. Uh, you have a lot of computers. You have a lot of tools they, that you are not going to use in these big buildings because they are not get, getting to be used. Then I am proposing here, and we use like an Andean word to describe it, like it's a, cl a kind of, after the Second World War, um, we know about the plan Marshall, the Marshall Plan to recover Europe uh, from the United States. I said it's a kind of plan Marshall for education, not only for Latin America, I think for the world, because uh, UNESCO and UNICEF, they are saying that we are losing like 10 years in education because of COVID, 10 years. It's an average in the world. Probably in some countries like mine, it is more than it's like a generation that we are losing. Then we have to apply emergency measures. And I call this a Minga plan. Minga is collective word that we have in the Andean countries. When you need to build a, 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 a new house or a new room, you, you, you don't need to call your neighbor. The neighbors come to, to you. It's in the rural uh, area and they, they help you to build. They don't get paid for it. They, they have a collaborative work. In, if in any case, other, uh, one of the neighbors need another help for plant uh, 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 seeds and to, to harvest corn or potatoes, they can count on the neighbors. That's the idea. And that's the reason that I call it a minga for education in all the world. How it works with local authorities, where we get in the connectivity with the, the private sector and the NGOs providing the tools. It could be a, a, a desktop, a laptop, an iPad, a cell phone, a smartphone. Because if you have a small phone, as a prepaid one, you cannot connect. You, can, you, are, you are not going to attend classes with a small phone that probably share it by all family. Then you need that. And the other thing is um, um, an agreement between ministers of education and universities. And that's the real Marshall Plan. Why? Because I think that the students of the uh, high levels, it could be students of mathematics, of uh, medicine, of whatever, they must be tutors of the youngsters. If they can be, for example, here in Ecuador, you can have a classroom, it could be online or, or presential, with 50 or 60 students. How can the teacher, this only teacher, can deal with these 60 or 50 students? It's impossible. But if you have one student for every 10 students, uh, these uh, um, teenagers or, or, or these kids, you can have a revolution on education. You can have a lot of, uh, or plenty of volunteers from the universities doing that work. I am absolutely sure, uh, sure that uh, a student of medicine can teach biology much better than a, a, a school professor or a student of engineering can teach mathematics and they can also take care about what, um, Francis, or I don't remember your name, says about the tenderness, the possibility to be in connection with the other, psychological uh, support, uh, 
uh, needs that they can help, and it could be in any community, then this minga about education ta can make a real difference in our world. And I am trying to, to, to talk about it in as many forums and, uh, as I can, and I'm trying to convince my authorities here in Ecuador and in other countries to, to start to work on it. If not, we are going to be very lack and very, very far from of these 2030 achievements. We cannot do it. It's Sorry if I take insights. Oh, yeah. no, no, that's, that's fantastic insights. Thank you. Um, Bruce, just wanted to ask you a quick follow-on question to that. Like, what, what's your... What's your understanding of the, the power of community to um, bring people together and, and create value and sort of, um, you know, create that, 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 you know, that wealth which lifts people out of poverty? Yeah. I'm just voting for Rosalia at this stage. <laughs> no, I, found, I think what you said there, it taps into everything that I'm, I'm sure the, whole, the, the complete, the panel bull, sees truth in that. Um, I think we just underestimate the value that gets created by collective activity. And sometimes we restrain ourselves into thinking about the value we can contribute in certain pockets. And Rosalia is talking about an old way of thinking of teaching is that someone's a trained teacher and they are therefore the only teacher. Um, we need to disrupt a whole lot of our thinking around in collective activity um, everyone brings a set of values. So if you talk about it at a, at a macro system, um, I'm a huge, I spent a lot of time in universities looking at universities and how they can contribute to the local community, the local cities' problems. Spent, and spent a lot of time in Philadelphia and at Penn, University of Pennsylvania, where it's just a given that students, everyone is participating in problem solving. And it's part of the pedagogy of a university is, in fact, to have a mission which is to its local community. So activating universities globally, the three and a half thousand universities in America, the 38 in Australia, the 27 in South Africa, the eight in New Zealand, if you activate a global movement of universities participating in rapid scaling of solutions, of students, of professors, of alumni, of, of, of uh, industry partners. So to me, um, Again, Rosalia's initial statement that education is the solution. I mean, that's there's no doubt about that. There's from Mandela to, to our own indigenous leaders here in Australia, it's education. Um, if we're talking about access to connectivity, I, I very much um, agree with Robert's belief. It's not so much technology, it's connectivity for me. Um, because if we bring in connectivity around this this ancient idea of community development um, which effectively for me is a trilectic of from I to you to we which we get stuck in I and you should be doing this and it's politics but as soon as we can get to that third part of the tri tri trilectic of we we can bring in technology as a way of, of connectivity and what we're seeing is this rapid change from procurement of solutions to problems like poverty um, I've participated in winning grants to go and try and solve poverty. That's an old way of thinking. It's giving money to a group of people who are like picking a horse in a horse race and thinking that's going to be the team that solves poverty. Like what would happen if we opened up the connectivity of problem solvers on earth, universities, governments, private bodies, General Electric, through to the state government of South Australia, through to... University of Pennsylvania, what if we could think about a global mind that allows us to have connectivity around rapid solutions to the issues um, in Rosalia's communities of her kids not having actually, you know, having access to technologies and having access to computers and teachers and and what if <clears throat> what if we could scale it from being a very much a targeted solutions focus rather than a tendering of large agencies being paid to see whether they can solve it. And so there's this huge shift at the moment. I think that um, we should be getting very much testing and, and checking, which is this idea of global challenges, whereby there are recognitions and rewards, whether that be financial, whether that be notoriety, recognition and reward can, can be met in multiple ways. Um, if there was a focus on tenderness in some of these, so I think taking Robert's 
idea there's there's a different way of thinking of solutions. So using this idea to maybe allowing Robert's idea wouldn't typically get up in a large scale process. It would require a lot of effort. But you'll find across the world there are a lot of people who would back Robert's perspective of frame this problem through a, through a lens of tenderness. And so my, I, I'm a huge believer that even Harassus itself with its 8,000 community of leaders, we have this massive capacity to, to really, in a simple way, um, do things cheaper by using our, t- our, c- our connectivity, doing less work. Um, we're finding solutions to COVID. We're finding solutions to dementia literally in the last 24 hours because we're opening the problem up for everyone to participate in solving. Um, this is not professionals. This is not government owning the solutions. Government could do something pretty exciting by funding technology, the connectivity of the world to identify social innovations which are, which are working and then we all get in and help scale those innovations which are working. Now, I know, Nicholas, you're with Economics Without Borders, Economists Without Borders, I think it is. Those sorts of models of, of professions without borders was a very new idea 10, 20 years ago, but it's now the way it works. Like, we are without borders. It's it's just normal. So I think that we can be using it to... I think our connectivity can, can fight corruption um, of the use of grants. I've, I spent quite a lot of time in Africa... We, and by shining a light on success, on, on social innovation that's working, we can bring efficiency, we can close the gap, um, we can open, the for me, open doors to ideas we can't even imagine. Um, teams of people working together, sports heroes working with, with, with social innovators and, and, and influencers, and, and we get a whole new mix. That's the exciting part for me of right now is that we have, this massive capacity to almost let go of being identifying who the problem solvers are and letting it be a global conversation and a global challenge. So, and I should say, including getting connectivity, we're working a little bit with the Indigenous community about why wouldn't we involve all Indigenous communities in policy development by having access to technology. So that so the structural side has to be fixed. Kids. In, in, in Rosalia's community, do need to have tools to access the uh, the uh, collective intelligence that we have together. So, so we we haven't really even started yet in my mind. But COVID was a great example of how we can activate immediate, rapid responses to solutions in identifying ways to track it, identifying ways to um, uh, develop up vaccinations, also rapidly billions and billions of dollars sent to it. Um, there, there are certain, there is a way that through a lens of tenderness, I think it will soften the world to be much more open to contributing your smart, our own smarts, our own resources. So, so there, is a, there is a solution. We've just always had it as an unsolvable solution. Collectively, there is a solution. That's fantastic. Thanks for those insights, Bruce. Um, I just want to ask the question, of the panel, what misconceptions do you think persist in relation to poverty? Uh, have you seen any that you've come across in your professional work that, you know, you think, you know, there's this idea or this concept of, of poverty which is not quite right and that misconception is actually a barrier to implementing a, a workable solution? Uh, Robert, let's jump over to you. Yeah, I, I think in the U.S. Um, and maybe other countries too, I mean, I, I have a, a foundation, um, my family foundation, and we do work in like <laughs> tough neighborhoods in, around New York, in like Brownsville, Brooklyn. We did a program to create entrepreneurs, and then we worked with the school there. It's a wonderful principal, Nadia Lopez, the Bridge School, which they, they teach kids to be entrepreneurs. And one of the things you see, if you've never been in the neighborhood, and if you're white, especially, it's an African American neighborhood, and you're not and you're, let's say you're in Manhattan and you didn't take the trip out to Brownsville, you have this perspective that, and I remember when I, I, I told someone, Peter Thiel, we all know Peter Thiel, uh, I, was, I was at a conference and I was sitting next to him and I was talking about trying to create entrepreneurs in the inner city and, and he was saying, like, why would you do that? If, if these people could, they would leave where they are in these bad neighborhoods and like find their way out. Like why, 
Why did we need to do this? And he was funding people not to go to Harvard. And I think there's a perspective that people in these neighborhoods are lazy and that they're government funded. They're, they're like, the government's just putting them on funding all day and they don't have an incentive to get out of these neighborhoods or, or stay in the neighborhoods. So what I found when I was there was an eye opener. It's like people in Brownsville are proud of Brownsville. They grew up in Brownsville. It has like this tough neighborhood. It has the most shootings in anywhere in New York City. It has a, a, a and killings are in this one like twenty square block radius. And but 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 they're very proud of their neighborhoods. They're very proud. They want to stay there. They want to make change. Except not a lot of people came in like governments and would. Like the new mayors would come in and say, we're going to fix Brownsville. They always had like the 60 days to fix Brownsville pl plan. There was no 60 days fixing Brownsville. And mm -hmm. they were very much disenchanted that they felt government and, and, and nonprofits would come in and kind of like get bored with it and leave. But I found there were a lot of people there who just wanted a chance to be mentored. To uh, They all are entrepreneurs. There's a lot of entrepreneurs in these neighborhoods uh, that are doing something to make money not everything's illegal i mean they're doing real things and we ended up funding some women who make cakes and cookies and things and and stuff like that that was one of our projects but i i just think that there's a sense that if people could they would get out of the their bad situations or these poverty like they're just lazy i think that's this is this white rich uh perspective on these neighborhoods, at least I'm saying in, in, where I live and, and, and a lot, a lot of in the United States. Uh, Rosalia, what, what are your um, thoughts on misconceptions in relation to poverty? Well, um, there are some, some ideas about why, why people is, uh, or falls into poverty. And there are some some answers. Sometimes there are political situations in some countries, like what happens in Venezuela right now, with uh, more than five million people leaving the country. Um, we have almost uh, half a million in Ecuador from Venezuela, and one uh, million of Colombians here because of the violence in Colombia. Then, of course, there are situations that uh, are out of the mind of, of the people, how they can uh, fall in poverty. The other thing is about um, climate refugees. It's starting to be a, a, a big problem. For example, when, when you see what's happening in Central America with all the people trying to go into the United States and also from Latin America, but uh, especially from, from Central America, and you see, of course, there is violence in Salvador and in the other countries, but uh, the land is exhausted also. They don't have the crops that they used it to have. And uh, it is, uh, there are a lot of big hurricanes and storms that they, in the past they were not so heavy and not so frequent. Uh, I, I see, I, I used to live in Brazil, and when I was living in Brazil, it was the first time that they, they have a big hurricane into Santa Catarina. It was totally unusual. Then climate refugees, I think that we have to, we must to think about what will happen with the climate uh, challenges and how the people of the coasts on the island are going to react and, and go to the other places. And it increases the level of poverty, of course. And, and you have the lack of education, the lack of, of opportunities, corruption that uh, I think uh, um, <coughs> uh, mentioned, uh, that is terrible. But when you see how uh, the, 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 the budget of the, of the country and, and you see the percent of the, that budget that goes into corruption, it is terrible. Then we have to fight against corruption in our countries because people is losing faith in democracy, in democracy, because they think that democracy doesn't add anything. And probably sometimes the dictators or, or the populists that solve situations for a moment, they feel that, uh, and people feel, uh, and, and people from uh, poor areas, uh, from rural areas, from the, the, the belts around the city, uh, the cities, they think uh, a lot about uh, how the populists can solve the immediately needs and uh, how democracy is failing. 
then we have to, to talk a lot about uh, um, corruption and how we can uh, uh, talk about values into the society. It could be, of course, at home, because it's a, a link, a very, very close link between homes and school. Homes and school have to go together. But in the past, uh, I think it's changing during the COVID times. But in the past, uh, the, the parents say, OK, they are at the school and, and the school has the responsibility and we don't have the, the responsibility. And uh, of course, uh, the um, uh, scientific solutions are, are very interesting, but they are not available for everybody. And the other thing uh, is that science is a tool and you can use a tool for good or for bad, hmm? mm. for good or for bad. Mm. Mm. Then, for example, in my NGO, I lead an NGO since a long time ago. We are working, for example, in a STEM project with the Academy of Science of New York. We made an agreement with them and we have the curricula of uh, the scientific process, how to teach the kids to, to have uh, open minds for science. Because in Latin America, you know how uh, poor is the access to the scientific pro professions for the students because they don't develop the, the a friendship approach to the science and things like that. Well, we are working on STEM and we, we, we get the curricula, but we put an E before the STEM, an E for ethics. Hmm? It's so important because science without ethics can destroy the world. And you know very, very, uh, well, it more than me because you are in the science uh, level. I'm not a scientist, uh, but um, I strongly believe in the solutions that science can provide for for the whole world. I'm very optimistic about the tools of the science, the possibilities, extraordinary possibilities of uh, um, the artificial intelligence, robotic. Uh, Internet of Things, and all these uh, these areas that we are talking about many times, but without the E of ethics, it's not going to work. And I'm absolutely sure that we have to mix and to have a multitasking uh, vision for this kind of uh, of problematics to give the 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 right solutions, because it it doesn't have to be like. A one side solution. It has to be a multivisionary solution. And uh, uh, one, one of the areas that we have a lot of, or we have to put a lot of impact is about ethics. How the, the old values, because the, the values, they are not old fashioned. They, they are not. They are, if you, you, you talk about the, to be a honest person, to, be, to practice tolerance to practice solidarity, these are, they, these are old values, but they are not all fashioned. They are still now very important. And we need we need to talk about that with young students, with teachers, with parents, in the media, in the social network, because uh, we have now a big echo. In the past, we didn't have that echo. Social network is a big echo but about anything that we want to talk and to say. And it's so important that we cannot avoid to talk about values when we are talking about science, education, fight to, uh, against poverty, uh, the climate change, and other things. Brilliant. Yeah, it's really, really insightful. I, I guess in light of the pandemic, what, what specific interventions do we need to see to to get back on track to you know, eradicating poverty more quickly. Um, Bruce, do you have any insights from your particular field of expertise? I guess self-reflecting on our own country, we've been recognised globally as fixing, um, of reducing, uh, you're speaking, Nicholas, to COVID, is that right? The, yeah, 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 in, in general. Because yeah, yeah. uh, yeah. we could use COVID as a metaphor for a lot of things, but... Um, Absolutely, but uh, but Australia has been recognised. As always, we we are very good at policy development, policy architecture. We're good at government. It probably comes from a history of policy wonks coming and spending time here from England when they're when they're not in government. They come out to Australia and hop into innovation labs and policy labs and things like that. So we've always attracted smart policy people. What we're terrible at doing, though, is implementing policy. Um, and one of the learnings that I, we've seen just recently is 
whilst we maintained a low number of uh, of our COVID um, patients here in Australia, we suffered from a slow vaccination process. We're still trying to sort it out. And we've got a long history, even with our Indigenous community and health and that, of strong design, cr strong planning, but, but poor implementation. And and doesn't matter whether it's a red or blue, you know, whether it's Liberals, Democrats, it's, there's just this sort of... Um, we tend to default to not not implementing well. And I think at the moment it's kind of if you use it as a metaphor for the world around around the confronting issues of poverty, there's a lot of great designs, there's a lot of great ideas, a lot of architecture that could be, but it's that implementation bit that gets me, um, that I'm most interested in, is how do you rapidly implement successfully the good ideas? Um, and so COVID, I think, has taught us, I, I would have said from our perspective in, um, in terms of... Um, uh, Robert's your world, you know, in the US, we were looking outside in and we thought, well, crap at trying to, terrible at trying to stop COVID, but incredible at fixing the problem. You know, like you, you, most of your community is now vaccinated or protected. And yet it seems like in a blink of an eye yesterday, you were, there was a hundred million people were, had, you know, were still seeking support and so forth. So, so maybe uh, part of it for me for COVID, just thinking about how we've how how the world has responded to that. It's been amazing to watch our countries have gone with their strengths um, and and also acknowledge their own weaknesses. And again, it comes back to that collectively we're better than if we operate independently. Um, I'm concerned about our future economy um, in terms of the impact it has on our economy and our basically. We react again, speaking locally. Re we've reacted heavily to lockdowns, um, and that's caused quite a lot of uh, anxiety within our small, medium business community. So we've been doing a lot with. We have over two million small, medium businesses, and they're all pretty much worried about what, how, does, how do they live in this new world? And they're, they're 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 small companies that are trying to sustain families, and so. Um, yeah, so that's just some off-the-top thoughts, Nicholas, but I do think that um, it sort of has exposed countries for those who have been able to design and execute well and those who've done a little bit of, of either. Or, but I'll be interested in the other panellists' thoughts on that one. Yeah. Um, I'll just note we are nearly out of time. So um, quickly I'll run to, to each of you and turn to leave some, some closing remarks and maybe reflect on what, what excites you most about the opportunities ahead to, to try and eradicate poverty. Uh, Rosalia, over to you. Well, I didn't bring up uh, a uh, gender issue, but it has to, to be, be a lot with gender issues because uh, during the pandemic, we, we feel that uh, we are losing a lot of track, like women in, in work, because uh, a lot of women are losing work. Uh, sometimes voluntarily because they want to stay at home with the kids and in other uh, um, situation because they are um, <coughs> they are avoiding in, in the companies uh, uh, to take measures against everybody but gender uh, women are, are more fragile to lose the jobs and the other thing is the uh, the violence at home uh, it's increasingly levels in all all parts not only in Latin America even in US even in Europe and I think we have to talk a little bit more about uh, how the pandemic is affecting a uh, woman. And the other issue that I want to remark is about the need to, to focus on education and, and health, in public health and public education to improve quality of life and also to, to fight against poverty. Because at least uh, people can, uh, need to have access to good uh, quality, um, to quality education and quality health. And it's a, a work that has to be done with the, by the government, but also we put a lot of uh, emphasis in what the local governments can do and the society. I, I love what uh, Bruce says uh, many times about the collective solutions because we need to work uh, together, together, and it's mm -hmm. very important. And Robert, what, what are your thoughts? 
you know, I, I go back to my, I think the pandemic uh, just shined a light on a bunch of stuff, as we all know. It's like I have on my wall here, it says, like, what what is the virus asking us to change? And this was something I put on my wall yeah. in the first week it, as I was talking to my, my team. It's like I let them see that. Like, it's asking us to change something. And though I think I go back to this idea of tenderness, I've just seen the power of the unit of one, like, we know there's people in our neighborhoods. I go back to being in New York City. There's people who are within two or three blocks to where I live who are who are suffering. But we kind of don't think that. You know, we don't see them. And I think if if everyone just tried to in the unit of one find someone, you know, connect with them. You, there's there's shelters. It starts with the brain realizing through a, a through an experience of giving that there are people in need. And I just, I found like we, we feed 5,000 families a year in New York city during Thanksgiving. And I found this project to be really for the last 20 years. What's the power of it is somebody who has means who doesn't, you know, delivers a turkey dinner to a family that may be 20 blocks away from them. And and it just changes their perspective on these people, changes the perspective on helping each other and, and providing this, what I call tenderness, you know, looking someone in the eyes. And so it's so complicated.